Philosophers were courageous people. So what in the world could have happened to philosophy when a, a form of professionalization almost valorizes, rationalizes, uses as the ethical conditions of professionalism what ultimately comes down to cowardice? Well, these things don't happen accidentally. And in many ways, if you take the time to look at that history, you have a different understanding. But since I'm only going to talk for 40 minutes, I'm going to move in a more summary fashion. The first thing is there's something still probably, even though I said courage, when you hear courage, people think of soldiers, valor. But I'm not talking about that kind of courage. You see, that kind of courage exists in the context of war. And this, this is rather amusing because many of you know there's a model of philosophy that simply treats it like, you know, you already know you're going there because you walk in and it's like they're waiting. And they're going to try to knock you down and you're going to defend yourself and it's a fight. But with that model of philosophy, the problem is you're so busy trying to win that you're no longer paying attention to reality. That kind of philosophy, although they may bring up truth, knowledge, justice, all kinds of concepts, the fact of the matter is if you're only concerned with winning, then lots of things fall to the wayside. And after a while, once we, you know what happens when reality falls to the wayside. You begin to defend a conception of how to do what you do that has no relevance. And you all know this. Many of you, when you're in philosophy, you think of smart people who say a lot of things that are irrelevant. Now, that's not been historically what philosophy was. It doesn't have to be that. But that dominates it, the discipline, for a reason. But if you try to imagine another conception of philosophy, what if, for instance, you do pay attention to reality? Well, one of the things you begin to realize is that you're a human being and you have limited relationships to reality, which means you have to communicate with other human beings and you get to learn about reality together. It means that when you think of your interlocutor, you think of that person as having something to contribute and you think of yourself as having something to contribute, but you hope that what the other person contributes is the revelation of what your limitations are. In other words, you develop the humility to be able to say these very unusual words that you rarely hear in the academy today. And those words are, oh gee, I was wrong. And so within that framework then, if we look at this question, now we bring it to the question of philosophy of education, you begin to see, for instance, on the sign, you see the word school a lot. And the word school a lot is actually, school comes from the Greek word skole. And the concept of skole, and I remembered when I'd done a few things, including create a school in New York, and it was for adolescents, and one of the things when I explained to them what skole was, it shocked them. The word skole from which you get school means leisure time. <laughs> I know, you can imagine telling some adolescents, especially the ones who are really like, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Leisure time. But the idea was that, you see, the rest of the animal kingdom has to struggle with exigency. They're just trying to do basically three things. One is eat. The second, avoid being eaten. And the third is if you can achieve both, get a little chance to contribute some genetic material to your species. That's pretty much it. However, we have created human beings. We have this thing called culture. And within it, we have communication. And we have all of these things. And we have memory. And we have ways of transmitting knowledge that somehow make us not have to worry that much about a food supply. And the rest of well, we've killed off most of the other animals. And so what pretty much happens is that we suddenly have time to devote to things that, well, are human things. And so the idea of scholae, interestingly enough, was linked to, human, to, to anthropos, which is actually linked. So the idea is school was about the activities that cultivate your humanity. Today, when you hear about the humanities, what's frightening is pe many people in the humanities don't even understand what the humanities is. 
because they think it's about certain form of disciplines and textual production and blah, 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 blah. They don't understand. It's about the cultivation of your humanity. But now here's where we get into some trouble. Because you see, if, you, if getting leisure time can give you a little more time to be human, maybe if you create a system where some human beings get a lot more leisure time than other human beings. And if they could get even a lot more, then it makes them, in their mind, more human than anybody else. And in ancient Greece, Greece philosophy didn't begin in ancient Greece, by the way. It's just that formulation of it. That you can go back easily about 2,000 years before that and see philosophical stuff going on, not only in North Africa and East Africa, but also in parts of Asia. But you see, the thing to remember is that Athens, the Athenians, Greek society, was a society in which four-fifths of the population were slaves. And within that framework of slavery were people who were called undeveloped human beings. You know who those undeveloped human beings were? If you read Aristotle's On the Generation of Animals, they were what we today call females. In that society, in other words, having females stratified to exigency and other groups stratified to exigency, that meant a class of people could relax and say, man, it's so good to be human. So we have this complicit and complicated history already. But you see, within that framework, certain things come into play. Because you see, somebody, there were always people fighting to say, but wait a minute. If we distribute the way we actually deal with exigency, maybe more people could have leisure time. And in fact, certain historical and political forces affected what we talk about with education today. But the basic premise of becoming human, scole, linked to it, was also connected to educare. Because educare means to grow, to lead out. And so one of the first things you learn about education that you have to take seriously, you see, people today don't understand education is supposed to change you. There are people who think they just want to get a degree. There are a lot of people looking for certification, but not education. Now, you could get a lot of certification and still be a damn fool. But education is something more. Because you see, there are people with certification, for instance, who don't have dignity, don't have freedom, don't have an understanding of what it is to establish a world in which you diminish degradation and you facilitate the conditions for the flourishing of our species. And it's within that framework, when you think about it, that began to affect a very important tension that goes all the way to South Africa today. Because that tension is how do you expand freedom? How do you expand the conditions through which human beings can cultivate their humanity? Now, what makes it even more tricky is that something else happened in between. Because you see, in Aristotle's world, in a lot of the, 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 the ancient North African, Southern Mediterranean world, they were transitioned into a thing called Christianity. And within Christianity, there wasn't any Europe. There was a place called Christendom. But as we know, Islam emerged, and it controlled the economies of the Mediterranean, and it put Christendom into an 800-year economic depression. I mean, you think 2008 was bad. You know, that's where you go from, uh, you know, Holy Roman Empire and soap and water to a piss pot throwing out the window and all kinds of things. But in 1492, when Ferdinand and Isabel knocked the Moors out of Grenada and Columbus took to the seas, suddenly something was established. And what was established brought along with it a concept that challenged the way Christendom saw the world. Because you see, in Christendom, they had a concept called raza. And raza referred to breeds of horses, dogs, Jews, and Moors. Yeah. And that term raza, when it got into the new world, became confused because there were people 
who are not Jews, Christians, and Muslim. And so that theonaturalism, that very idea that God ordered the world in such a way that to be human was to be Christian, began to collapse. And as it began to collapse, a form of secular naturalistic conception of Raza emerged that transformed it into race. And that term that became race was also transformed because what began to happen in that world was a realignment of the Christian world, a realignment into the concept called Europe. And that realignment began to create something very different because you see, at the heart of that problem was Christians transforming into Europeans who are asking the question, what are we? And that what are we question began to get studied because one of the things they wanted to believe is whatever we are, we are special, which means they are not. And that we-they relation began to cultivate what we can call a philosophical anthropology. That philosophical anthropology, premised upon race, is actually what produced in the modern world the human sciences. Many of you, for instance, are told, don't even look into that stuff. Just be rigorous sociologists, political scientists, philosophers, econo economists, all of these areas that are connected to human sciences, good biologists, good blah, 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 you know, go down the list. The problem with that, and they treat race as an infection, a kind of adulteration of that pure discipline. The problem is they don't know the history of their own disciplines. Those disciplines were produced out of an effort to articulate racial difference. So what in effect happened is that that effort to create that generated not only the human sciences, but also even some of the critical inquiries into the human sciences. Because you see, in Aristotle's world, an undeveloped man is different from our world. Because you see, if you're gonna conquer a lot of the planet, if you're gonna colonize the globe, how, how, what happens when you now say undeveloped people? What happens to the previous undeveloped ones who were female? Are you going to say an entire race of people are female? So what happened is in the effort to realign that system, you know what came out of it? Gender. Because you now needed to have a category of human being that didn't exist before. And that is called a white woman. So within that framework, it aligns with an anthropology that says a superior group is white, and then there's the rest. And that, ironically, is something that people in gender studies don't realize. It was race that produced the modern conception of gender. And that is one of the reasons why there's such an anxiety today in race to create these categories of demonic male conceptions, particularly men of color. It's also what creates an anxiety and a seduction for women of color because it says you can enter that anthropology if you could leave the color behind. You see what I'm getting at? Now, within that framework, a different, something happens because, you see, if you're going to come to the table of humanization, you're going to have to have a more critical conception of that anthropology. When you talk about what a human being is, and if you're going to talk about, for instance, instead of war, knocking down people, but deal with reality, well, one of the things you learn about human reality is no human being is a god, which means no human being by herself or himself is self-sustaining. We are all in a relationship with each other. And that fundamental relationality transforms even the philosophy. You see? Because it means then, if you're going to deal with the cultivation of human beings, you're going to have to have a relational communicative practice. But now it gets very tricky. Because you see, even with the emergence of white women, the presupposition of that world was that education was for males. And when education, because the idea was only males could be fully developed. 
And that's one of the reasons why the history of a lot of education was dominated by males, and males who were, by the way, well paid. However, certain forces emerged in which societies began to argue for the expansion of education. Because among other things, not only in the 19th century, as ideas like Marxism and those began to pop up, but also in the 20th century, when you had the Cold War, the big issue is you needed to find a shift in education. Now, to understand this, you need to understand what higher education was. We look at higher education as if higher education has always existed. So we imagine, for instance, in the ancient world, people say, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to college. Didn't exist. During the periods of the Middle Ages, there was theonaturalism. So education was linked in your relationship to faith and reason, in other words, to God. But once the emergence of global capital exploitation emerged, suddenly you had people who needed to manage a world that was on the other side of the planet. And so the actual universities that began to pop up in Europe were actually created to produce civil servants to manage empires. You see? And with, that's one of the reasons why Oxford was created and why the University of Paris was the way it was. It went from the theological framework because you see the thing about priests is that they were literate. But now if you want to manage books and keep records and make sure you don't get, you know, you want to get revenue and taxes, you needed to have civil servants. When the United States popped up and its educational system was there, its educational system was still trying to imitate Oxford or France, you're right, you know, those, England or France, but it also wanted to have technological innovation. So its education system was trying to decide whether it should be German or, or British, and it fused them. But its goal, ultimately, was for an economic empire. Now, already, you begin to see something very different, because you see, the original model then was you needed to have a large, skilled workforce, but minimally skilled. So the original idea was to get people who can have secondary level education. But that project of mass education was expensive if you stuck to the model of male teachers. So they had a great idea. And you know what that idea was. Why don't we have women become teachers and hardly pay them anything? And that was an actual active movement to get women into teaching and they were being paid so abysmally. In some cases, they just had boarding. That, and among them was a woman called Susan B. Anthony, but there were others like Anna Julia Cooper, and they were saying, oh my god, this is ridiculous. This led to the galvanizing of these women into unions and organizing. And that's what led to the suffragette movement, and it led to all kinds of things around education. But if you're wondering, today you can't even think of primary and secondary education without thinking of women teachers. But what you don't realize is that it was a function of sexism because of the idea was to exploit these women. And so within that framework, what you begin to find, because that becomes a crucial question, is when the Soviet Union and all these other things popped up, you see, at that moment, the question of mass education came on board. But it wasn't designed to deal with scolé. Because you see, scolé, if you cultivate your humanity, if you really cultivate your, your sense of esteem and self, you know what you want to do. You want to lead. If you want, to, in other words, real education produces dissent. Real education challenges docility. Real education basically makes you get up and say, I do not want to be treated this or that way. So if you want to have a docile managed underclass or limited class, you want to make, get them have certification and skills, but not education. This is something Antonio Gramsci thought about. Because a lot of people should wonder, why did this leader of the Communist Party in Italy wrote so much about humanistic education. Why did he do that? 
Because his view was, if you stay purely at a skills level, you don't know even why or the principles of your skill. However, if you can understand the principles and the conditions by which you do what you do, you now have access to something that's very important. It's not only freedom, but it's something that's feared in a society that wants to hoard and crystallize in one particular group domination, and that is power. You see, we talk a lot about power, but a lot of people don't understand what power is. You know, what they do, in fact, the thing to do right now in the academy is to make power as sexy as possible. So they like terms like biopower, you know. Or then we have a kind of Oedipal thing with power. People get anti-power. Power corrupts. I won't be powerful. Oh, male power. You know, female power. Power, power. Sovereign power. All that stuff is stupid. You know why it's stupid? None of you will stand a chance in reality if you didn't have even a modicum of power. Because what power is, is the ability to make things happen. Your body has power in its ability to reach. I could reach for that water or I could speak. Because we've created culture and intersubjective relation of social reality, I could be here, but my words have meanings there. And if someone listens to these lectures on another side of the planet, it continues to have an impact. That is what power is. Power could lead to something where a decision made by some of you could lead to whether people are starving in one side of the planet and struggling with diabetes on another. But you see, that at the moment is just simply the basic mechanics of power. Because you see, human beings have decided that power also, if it can make things happen, there's some things we need to have happen as human beings. And so we've decided to invest it in institutions of power. And among those institutions is the one called government. Think about it. I mean, at the metaphysical level, you know what power is metaphysically. It's God. I mean, it doesn't make sense for God to be God without power. Can you imagine? Hey, who are you? I'm God. Yeah, oh, God. wow. Do something. <laughs> I can't. Don't have the power anymore. Yeah, yeah. What kind of God are you? But similarly, if governments are to do things, that's why they need power. Because you see, governments are supposed to provide services. And, among, and precisely because we have endowed them with our faith in them to provide services, that's one of the reasons why governments depend on legitimacy. And among the services we expect, especially in democracies for governments to supply, is to facilitate the conditions, not only for our protection, not only for our, you know, our security, not only on the question of having health, but in the world we live in, governments are supposed to create the conditions for our human flourishing. That's why education policy is part of governments. But as we know, there are governments, and then there are governments. Some governments say, we have a purpose. But some governments say, you know, we could distribute this power into services, but we could also just, well, let the things that happen is some of us get a little richer. <laughs> some of us get a little more service. And in fact, because we have this thing called a police force, we can get some people to be a little more scared. Mm -hmm. You know, we can also get all kinds of things. We, wow, we could be kings and queens. And, my God, we could be gods. And at that point, you know, you're in danger. And so within that framework, one of the things you need is the distribution of power. But you see, you notice the language is police force because it's presumed they are legitimate. But when they're rendered, rendered illegitimate, you know what you call it, state violence, police violence. 
And so these normative things now come to why, it's the second part. Although we say social justice, some of my colleagues at the University of Connecticut call themselves the Injustice League. Because the truth of the matter is, people say they're trying to figure out justice, but man, we know injustice when we see it. You know what I mean? And there are certain basic elements of injustice. For instance, it's already unjust if the mechanisms of power to facilitate having access to education is crystallized in so few that most people just get crap. Inequality of education is an injustice. We also know that injustice emerges in colonial education because very, by definition, colonial education turns you away from reality. Its purpose is to fix your gaze in such a way that you don't even see that you're being hoodwinked or as Malcolm X says, bamboozled. You don't get to see on a racist education that you're involved in a practice designed to make you get up every day and think of yourself as less. So that means education is a very powerful phenomenon. In itself, it is to affect a world that wasn't there before, and that world is you. You are getting educated if you become something more powerful than you were before. And so within that framework then, if you look at the context of South Africa, we already see, for we know what the injustices are. Already you could tell that, for instance, you don't just in 1994 create a group of laws and you get rid of colonial and racist structures. And one of the big problems is some people want to eat their cake and have it too. They would like to imagine that you could keep all the edifices of an education system designed for the cultivation, not of the humanity, but of the arrogance of some and the dehumanization of most. If you keep that structure in place, you can, you, all you're doing, even if you put more women and people of coloring in it, all you're doing is producing that system. And that is because a human being is not a thing. But you see, there are these errors. You see, some people think what they really want when, when, you know, a lot of us don't even realize. Most women in higher education, some of you are studying, literally studying, with the first in your institutions to occupy those posts. You know, people talk as though women were always professors. <laughs> but they don't realize most women professors you meet are making it up as they go along. There's no precedent. In some places, you talk about black professors. Well, there wasn't a history. So whether they succeed or fail, they only have, they're the ones making that history. And so within that framework, when you begin to think about the cultivation of dealing with that, now you begin to deal with a fundamental problem. Because you see, the expectation is for women to come into the academy, but keep it as it was. In other words, they just become men with vaginas. The idea is for black people, brown people, whatever color you want to call them, to come in but keep it as it was, which means they have to leave their color behind. In other words, you, what we're still doing is we're maintaining the fallacy of a white academy. And when you look at around South Africa, you see, and not just here, by the way, one of the things, I, first I have to tell you, some basic things before I continue. First thing is, all the times I've been coming to South Africa, there's certain observations. One is South Africa is a big country, but a small town, okay? The second thing that I've noticed in South Africa is that South Africa has been conditioned on the concept of mimicry. So what that does then is education in South Africa becomes a discussion of which previous imperial structure of education to imitate. It's totally true. So you know the conversation. Well, sh many people in South Africa are busy trying to be the British University, specifically Oxford and Cambridge. And then on Stellenbosch, they think,